The interesting thing about Kusitaki is that we come from various parts of the world. I am from Mexico, and Reinerson is from Omaha, Nebraska. David Jacobo is from Arizona. Dave Murphy is from Atlanta, Georgia. Mark Vanek is from Columbus, Nebraska. And Mike Schwebach is from South Dakota. This is one reason why we believe that this music is so special. When I first came to America, I was too busy trying to settle down that I had forgotten the music. In 1993, a group from Ecuador called Runa Pacha came to Lincoln and played at the state fair. Suddenly, the music came back to me. I talked to the band, and they invited me to play with them. When I was on stage, the feeling I had was so beautiful, I knew I didn't want to lose the music again, so I started the band. Kusitaki has had many members throughout the four years of existence. David Jacobo was the first one to join, He was also the state fair when I played with Runa Pacha. And he was playing with the group Runa Pacha at the fair. And we seen this guy that didn't seem to look like the rest of them. And I just assumed that he was their their uh, capitalistic leader who had brought them here to, to get rich off of them. And the next night or two nights later, I see him at the paper where I work. And so I said something to him and I told him that I'd seen him down in playing with the musicians, and, and he persuaded me into to, uh, joining his group because he needed bodies more than anything at the time. <laughs> I met somebody else that was in the group, uh, Kat Fritz. Um, she plays the violin, and she is also the Samponia player from, from Kuzitaki Past. And found out that I played guitar and said that uh, Kuzitaki was looking for guitarists. And see, I'm in this, I'm in this folk band, you know, and uh, you should come, come hear us play. And I kind of didn't think much of it. I thought, oh, folk music, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I first saw the band, well, both times that I first saw the band, uh, were down in the Haymarket uh, by the Apothecary Building. And, uh, you know, one time I, I was walking by and I saw them and I said, well, I had to be somewhere pretty quick. And I'm going, you know, damn it, it's been like one year since I've seen, you know, this music at the State Fair. And besides, these guys are probably just passing through Lincoln anyway. So I, I stayed for a couple minutes and had to rush off to make a deadline. The next time I was actually at the, uh, at the Haymarket, uh, the store Helping Hands had me there. I was playing Native American flute. And there was some type of festival or another going on down there. So uh, just as I was finishing up my set on the Native American flute, the, the members of Kusitaki, the original one, started filtering in. Well, I stayed and watched, and afterwards I met everybody in the group that was there, and uh, they just said, well, we're going to be getting together uh, the day after tomorrow, brother. If you wish to come with us, you know, we, we can come and you can listen to the music. The funny thing is, I was never, you know, he never said, Dave, would you like to join the group? He just said, we have practice on this day. So I was really never indoctrinated into the group. It's just I kept showing up. And Or my parents were antique dealers, and they were set up down at an antique show in Pershing Auditorium. And the band had been playing down there early in the day, but they had some problems with playing there. People didn't, they thought that they were trying to sell something, so they didn't want them there, basically. So they kind of kicked them out. But, so I was really upset that I missed them, but I brought down some flutes that I had made to show my parents because I just figured out this new kind of mouthpiece. It sounded great and wanted to show it off to them. And, and I was mad because they just missed the guys. And I would heard them play before. So I went off walking around looking at the different stuff in the show and all of a sudden I hear this, off in the distance, I hear this flute and I said, that sounds just like the one I just made. And I go back and there was Oscar just playing with it and he kept playing with it and looking at it. And he said, this is great, brother. You know, I really love this flute. He goes, do you make more flutes like this? I'm like, oh yeah, I got all kinds of flutes. So he invited me down to, I think it was down at the mill, him and Ken, Ray Nearson, and uh, showed him some of the flutes that I had made, and he showed me some that he'd made, and was really fascinated by them, and invited me to a couple practices, joined the band. I met Kusataki on the 14th. David Murphy gave me a flute on that day. I met them at the Hispanic Festival, and uh, they invited me to practice with them. And I think we practiced that Sunday, the 15th.
if I'm not mistaken, or shortly after. And I've been with the band a year, and I've been a member about six months. The name Kusitaki in the Quechua language means happy music. Quechua is the language of the Incas, spoken in the mountain regions of the Andes. Most Americans recognize Andean music from the Simon and Garfunkel remake of a traditional Peruvian song called El Condor Pasa, the flight of the condor. Everyone has their own style, and this is our version. So you guys understand the words, right? No. Uh, you understand that lie, 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 maybe, but uh, um, that song was not really in a language that you and I are familiar with at all. It's, it's, uh, it's not English, and it's not Spanish, but it's Quechua, Quechua. Can you guys say Quechua? Quechua. Yeah, okay. That's the language they speak up in the Andes. It's a Native American language. Um, and that song was kind of about what we're doing right here today. We're getting together, playing some music, and having a good time. So it's kind of a festive song. Um, this is folk music from where? From Quechua, from the Andes Mountains. So this music comes from the countries of Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, oh. and Chile, and Peru. And we are playing instruments that come from that area. We're playing things that come, that are handmade and from all different kinds of materials. We'll talk about that stuff a little later. I'm sure you've got some questions. So, we'll get to some more music. We're going to play a, a song that's about a bird. It's not Big Bird. Um, it's about a condor. Does everybody know what a condor is? It's a bird. It's kind of like the eagle of the Andes. So uh, this song is going to be called El Condor Pasa, which in Spanish means the flight of the condor.
Yeah, and they seem to enjoy it. Right? They really did, yeah. Yeah. And so did we. <laughs> and, yeah, that was, that was an amazing performance. <clears throat> the response of the kids was mm -hmm. great. They all loved it. You go to walk into a classroom with our instruments, and you know they had never seen anything like it before. And throughout uh, the time that we spent with them, they, afterwards they they thought it was pretty neat stuff, and they they were really they were, they were glad that we came to bring that. They you know at first they're they're not sh so sure what it's going to be. It's like you know it's folk music, and they kind of look at you. <laughs> And uh, it seems like the whole school knows you're there the second you step out of the car, you know. So I'm looking out the window. It's exciting. But, you know, they don't, they don't know what it is. I was probably 11 years old, and, and the first time I heard it was on Sesame Street, of all things. There was a group of, of people, that, you know, at that young age, I thought they were just Mexican. And they were talking to, uh, I think her name was Maria on the show, and they were talking about music. And I'm sitting here going, oh, yeah, they're going to break out the trumpets and the big guitars and play mariachi. And they, uh... They reached out to the side and brought up some pan pipes, and there was a big drum, and I was just enchanted. That was the first time I'd heard it, and the next time that I heard it, God, I was probably about 22 or so. That would be at the uh, Nebraska State Fair when uh, Runa Pacha came up to the State Fair, and uh, I heard it, I was probably 50 feet away, and I heard the strains of the pan pipe, and I mean, it had been years, but boom, I knew exactly what that was. I had spent a lot of time in Bolivia, and I had sort of fallen in love with the country and the culture and I had studied the culture and the people. That's where I was introduced to it. I was taking summer school in Chile, in the northern part of Chile, and there happened to be a, a folklore music festival one particular week and I had no idea what it was about. So I stumbled upon this and I went in and I was blown away. I had never really listened to the music in any length and all of a sudden it was non-stop music for three days and I fell in love with it and I bought some of the tapes and haven't quit buying them ever since. Did you know anything about Andean music? I knew absolutely nothing about Andean music before I met Oscar. I started playing some flute while I was in high school. I was in a jazz group. I played jazz saxophone, alto saxophone. And for a few songs, the instructor wanted a flute, but he wanted a special kind of sounding flute. So he got a well, Irish rosewood flute, and just fell in love with this thing. and thought, this is so simple, I could make one of these. He started playing around with it then, and he started doing research to libraries and different books, museums. Started copying down different designs and improving on them. Had you ever heard any music before? I've never heard it. I I think I I think I'd seen it played on the streets, but I didn't. I didn't know much about it at all. It was pretty new to me, and Oscar, Oscar's charisma kind of got my attention. He, he kind of walked in, and he's he's greeting everybody in the room, and he's you know he's just very friendly, and he meets me, and he's you know interested in in having a guitarist, and he he's, I think he think he made up his mind that uh, it would be a good thing to to have me join the group at that time, and he taught me a few chords. He really I was really humbled maybe the first practice because I thought I was. Uh, I thought I knew the gu guitar pretty well because well, I could do some fancy stuff here and there. But as far as my rhythm playing uh, went, I really needed a lot of work. Um, so Oscar taught me some rhythms. You know, one of the ways to, to learn rhythms is to, to practice on your on your chest. You know, just kind of walk around and I, for for days after this practice, I'd kind of walk around doing this. You know, people wonder what I was doing. And they were in the the children's section, not the main stage, the children's section. And um, and I was curious. I went to the main station and I walked around, walked around, looked at all the booths and stuff like that. And I came back to the kids section, and I had a cassette tape in my pocket. It was a band from a band called Runa Pacha that I met uh, at the state fair in '93. Uh, three years prior, and I, I was mesmerized. I loved the music. And I held it up to the band, and Dave Murphy said, "We're going to play a song off that tape." It was "Yolanda Safoy." You know, I thought, "Wow, they're going to play a song off this tape." Later on, 
I was I was telling David that I love the music, and he said, "Here, I have something for you." And then took a flute out of his out of his bag and gave it to me. Why did he do that? He's got a big heart. <laughs> Mike's just there walking around, and he hears the music too. Now he had been exposed to like Runa Pacha at the state fair, so he he knew what he was hearing and stuff. And uh, I'm always very open. If someone comes up to ask me about the music, I can talk their ear off. I have no problem with people asking me questions. But he kept asking questions like, you know, are you guys local? Uh, you know, how often do you get together and whatnot? Usually, you know, since I make flutes, I have a couple extra in my bag. And uh, I had talked to Mike probably a good hour, hour and a half before it was time for me to go. Because mysteriously, I'm always getting called away. I've got deadlines to meet. And uh, so... We, we, we talked with Oscar and stuff for a little bit, but he drifted back to me, and I said, look, you know, i got to go. Here's my number. Here's Oscar's number. And I said, if you really like the music, you know, here's a flute. Practice on it. And uh, he gave us a call and stuff, and so, you know, I figured, you know, he wanted to follow through on it. So he came to the next practice, and once again, another member that wasn't asked to formally join the group, he just kept coming. Why did you give a flute? I, I do that from time to time, and... I, I, when, I, when I do flutes, I don't look at it and say, all right, here's a beautiful flute. I'm going to screw somebody out of some cash for this. I just make the flute, and if somebody comes along and they want to buy it from me, fine. But if somebody comes along and I feel in my heart that they need it, I'll give it to them. What's more important, the band, the music, or your own life? Uh, I feel I'm very cyclical. Like I'll, I'll go through stages where, where my life becomes very important. Like I, I've got to uh, figure out what I'm going to do with my future, and I tend to travel more than than most people. That I, after six months or so, I start getting the itch to go back home or to go to Miami, where I lived for a while. I go down to Bolivia, and now when I do these things, I miss the music right away. And I miss the the band. Is there really my family at this point in my life? When any member of Kusataki is gone. There's a dip because if we don't have the chemistry. When everyone's there and we've we've we play we've played a few songs and we start gelling together, there's a good there's a great chemistry there. When one mem member is gone for any performance or any practice, it's just not kusasaki. <laughs> when you have all six members, it's cool. What really impressed me about band Kusitaki was the range that they had. I mean, I'd heard a lot of bands at the State Fair, different Ecuadorian bands and Argentinian bands, and they they have like the same basic rhythm patterns for almost all the songs they play because they just play Ecuadorian style music. But I mean, these guys were playing stuff that I'd never heard before. I mean, really mellow songs, really just intricate harmonies and rhythm patterns. So it was really, really attractive. When I first started out, I was just, how am I ever going to memorize all these and keep these all straight, play with these guys, because they don't have, there isn't any real time signature to the music, I mean, it's just, you follow along, basically. I mean, you lead a little bit with the drum, but it's mainly the drum and the guitar that control how fast it goes.
what's the future look like for Kusitaki? Do you think there is a future, or do you think this is just going to remain a local hobby? I think it's going to probably remain a local hobby with every once in a while. We may take it on the road, but but uh, we're, we're all so, so rooted in our own lives that it's hard to do it full-time. It's just... Uh, just something that we fit in on the side. But I think it's going to be here for quite a while in one form or another, as long as Oscar's around. When we start touring like in the Midwest, like on weekends, we've talked about doing different universities, you know, within a day's drive on weekends, you know, once a month. That would be okay, but if it got to where it took much more time than that, I'd really start to have a problem with it because my wife and I want to know we want to start a family soon. So I mean, that would really take away from it a lot. I mean, the most important thing in your life then is your kid. I mean, everything else is kind of secondary to that. There is a well outside possibility that you guys could become people who make a living out of it. I don't think it's necessarily wild. It's a possibility, you bet. I'm going to be a, a doctor musician. A doctor, a chiropractor who plays pan pipes. Yes, and I'll have the music in my in my office too. When the band goes on tour. I'll go with the band. And then I'll just, uh, I'll find a replacement, see if somebody can take my clients and so on and so on and so on. Well, I'll take my table with me, too. <laughs> I'll get a folding table, keep it in my car, or take it with me on the plane or whatever. <laughs> I want to keep playing. I want to keep sharing the music, the culture. Uh, I want to uh, teach, you know, whoever uh, wants to learn how to play the ins any instrument. So, um, you know, it's, it's welcome to, to, to come and talk to me and I want to be able to keep uh, the group, you know, and... Uh, you want to become successful? Successful. Would you like to do this for a living? Do this for a living? I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. Do you think it's possible? I believe it's, it's hard, you know. It takes a lot of work and... Uh, and commitment, but I think if you have the desire to do it, you can do it. Not for the money, you know, I wouldn't do it for the money. Um, I would do it for the respect they have for the music. If there was the chance of, uh, you know, getting more popular and getting more gigs, I would somehow make it work. Uh, you know, heaven forbid if we ever went professional or something, I'd definitely make it work. I think if you can remain open to to the possibilities, um, then good things can come your way. <laughs> Canción de Carnaval. This is another. This next song is another Carnival song. The, the name of the song is Señora Chichera.
Bailar 